So good to see you again. I really enjoy, and I really enjoy this, uh, this curriculum, the, the, the highlights thing that you've put together. It's really good. I encourage you to that, as well as the book, of course. And so good to see you again. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to Conversation. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the program a guest who's been on the program in the past some years ago, that being Ray Carey. And Ray Carey was, he has a very interesting uh, background. He was a former president C and chairman and CEO of a major corporation that he ran for something like 20 years called ADT, very successfully. Uh, has a degree in, in business from Harvard, I believe and in education, and then he's also dedicated himself to understanding the economic system in a theoretical sense, and has written a major book and dedicates a good deal of his life, if I'm not mistaken, to trying to help educate the general population and the opinion leaders and so forth about the possibilities of a world that could lead to a, a better situation than the one that we encounter through some of our own mistakes that we've made. And that book he's written is called Democratic Capitalism, The Way to a World of Peace and Plenty. And also, uh, we got a copy of it here. And Ray, once again, thank you really very, very much for coming in. It's a great, great pleasure to welcome you. Nice to be here. All um, right. <clears throat> I think I should comment first that yes, democratic capitalism always demands definition. Yes, OK. One of the persistent problems we've had is that the intellectual community, and particularly the educators, have never recognized that within capitalism there are alternatives, all the way from domination by finance capitalism, which we've allowed to our great dismay. Yes, yes. The we went crisis time. we're going through, mm -hmm. to democratic capitalism, which is uh, <coughs> reinvented by. A, a lot of not highly visible democratic managers that find out that's not only the fun way to run a business, but it's the most profitable way. You think of a business as the sum total of the efforts of the individual within that company. Happily, that's happening more and more now in the information age because their only resource is the cognitive power of their people. Mm. So they don't, they can't just make money by suppressing wages and benefits and buying a new machine, mm -hmm. they have to get the people motivated and contributing. That's very interesting, <clears throat> yeah. But mm -hmm. the, uh, we just mm -hmm. heard it recently, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the rather standard response to democratic capitalism is, <clears throat> isn't that an oxymoron? Yeah. And mm -hmm. my standard response to that is, uh, I don't think you've done your homework. Okay, uh, uh, yeah. And I think I think if we look in the broadest way at our, our history of great success, but also consistent failure. I mean, we, we've done okay, mm -hmm. but we could do so much better. Mm -hmm. And I think the, I blame it on two things. Finance capitalism has dominated the economy, and it's never been worse than in the last 25 years. But it's not exactly a new event. Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. was not a, Democrat, small d, mm. and he <coughs> he made a big speech at the 1787 Constitutional Convention. Mm. It was quite clear. We have to give privileges to the wealthy and powerful to get their help in running the government, and he did that. They always have had to do that throughout history, from Rome to the kings of England and so forth. There's a, a group that rules, the emperors in Rome and so forth. But I that's mean, People are used to that kind of a social order. That's the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Paradoxically, <coughs> Hamilton what, came from a very poor background and Nevis and St. Croix mm -hmm. and the uh, Virginia Gentry Jefferson was the one with more faith in the people. And he didn't think they'd get it right at the beginning, but they mm -hmm. get it right in due time. Yeah, they were I think today if we look at mm -hmm. what's going on in, in Washington, it's, you know, it's just disgraceful. But the, uh, <coughs> the politicians are more than ever in the control of the people with the money and the people with the votes do not have the education or the agenda to change it. And that's one of the things I try to work on. 
very good. And you're trying to educate them to that to some of those realities. But the, the curriculum that you have yeah, there. Yeah, show is, it here. I, I'll hold it up when yeah. you can. You can come in on it maybe. I'm going to share with a robotic camera. This is democratic capitalism curriculum. Yeah, go ahead. I think after nearly 20 years of trying to get more interest in the educational process and the alternative within capitalism, I decided I'd write my own curriculum, which I have. So well, now, you wrote the book. <laughs> when did you write the book, Democratic Capital? When was, was that published? It was published in 2004, which I think if you read the <coughs> sections, I'm not that happy about it, but I can make claim of uh, calling the disaster quite accurately a long time ago. The one of 2008? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I pointed out the uh, problems of the Fed and Chairman Greenspan. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he was uh, being deified and put on the cover of Time magazine and that type of thing. Yeah, he was. Yeah. But I went, I, I don't, I, we're not going to get into my work career, but uh, to <clears throat> understand what I'm trying and understand democratic capitalism, uh, let me comment on just a couple of things in my uh, business experience. Okay, fine, by all means. Yeah. Now you mentioned my Harvard Business School background. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Harvard Business School won't be very happy with me because I regularly remark that I learned more as a co-captain of the high school football team about how to manage <laughs> that I did at Harvard Business School. And that's, I'm quite serious yeah. about that. Because serious, that, uh, yeah. I don't think I could have uh, articulated at the time, but if you think of it, <clears throat> The two principles are the worth and the potential of every individual uh, and the environment of trust and cooperation. So you can see the, you can see the football player getting into top condition and learning the proper footwork, but the, the key thing of leadership is to not only provide that opportunity, but to get the, the cohesion and the spirit that you get from the uh, relationships with others. Think think. The, you think the same thing might apply to a musical metaphor where people sure. are, as they say, jamming or a philharmonic, that the timpani player is contributing according to their best effort yeah. and are able to, and then that could apply to this society in general, maybe in idealistic terms, that yeah, no. everyone ought to be able to maximize their own capability and work within a cooperative well, order. That, that, that really is the ultimate mission for the human species to have every, there would be every, advantages every to individual that. have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Uh, <coughs> that, that, that would be a lodestar, would it not? Yes, In exactly. terms of human re or responsibility for thinking people, yes. right. We, we fall short of that, always have, or how do you feel about that historically? We used to we, have chattel slavery. It didn't you know, sit I, I well think with a lot of the people. and We've yeah, had injustice throughout the whole of the human experience. You were commenting before the show started that uh, <coughs> you could trace, Marx traced the modes of production from slavery in Greece, slavery in Rome, mm -hmm. serfs, yeah. middle age, and then when we could have changed it, we didn't, so we had the wage slaves of the Industrial Revolution, but as I commented earlier, now in the information age industries, you have to have a democratic work culture or you you'll have a competitive disadvantage. We, we, we would have to have a democratic work order, but if we look back through history, we have not had no. a democratic work order. So we would have to have a system other than that which the institutional structures we've inherited out of history have put upon us, as it were, out of history. And there has to be a qualitative transformation from one mode of production which was not democratic. It's not been democratic from the days of serfs and slaves and women couldn't vote and all the injustices uh, compared to what the future requires. And so we're in a time of qualitative transformation in terms of the institutions, notions of human nature, notions of the larger role of the universe, structure of it and so forth, that we've inherited out of what was largely in terms of what we know now, an ignorant historical past. But they, once we freed the mind, okay. the technology moved. Okay. And the technology, the Industrial Revolution said we now have the capacity. We don't have the organization yet, but we have the capacity 
to eliminate material scarcity. Okay, that's fast. a huge, huge, huge. subject. No? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fast forward. Uh, you know, <coughs> they were, and when, they if were, I may, if I may, Ray, the, you, you identify that with the Enlightenment in a certain sense, 1776, yes. Yes. Uh, the coming out of the feudal period. Yes, yeah. that, okay. That yeah, okay. 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 Coincidence of history. Yeah. 1776. Yeah. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation and the Declaration of Independence. And the invention of the steam engine right. presaging a, an industrial revolution that was just over the horizon. Yes, yes. Nothing was manufactured, everything was handmade. Yeah. You know. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. But the, uh, <coughs> the Enlightenment, I was always impressed that, uh, including the French Enlightenment, were so anxious to learn that uh, Lord Bacon must have uh, <coughs> died uh, 150, 200, almost 200 years before the Enlightenment, but when they discovered him, one of the French Enlightenment, D'Alembert, mm. said that he uh, was so excited about reading Lord Bacon's challenge to use the protocols of the natural sciences in the organization right. of human affairs, uh -huh. that he says our responsibility is not to honor the Lord Chancellor but to study him. Uh -huh. and, yeah, and, right. And I think that... As a respect for knowledge, yeah. Yes, yeah. and I think that underscored <coughs> the idea that uh, <coughs> if, if we use the right truth-seeking process, mm -hmm. we could end up with the right organization. Why, we, wh we, uh, haven't, we haven't yet. The, well, the, no, we haven't yet, and the, re the future requires a world different than... And if you go over a longer sweep, and you have things called inflection points, where there are changes in knowledge that have to be uh, uh, translated in institutions and practical reality. There are inflection points and everything. But if you go back over, I was just chatting with you, it's uh, Homo sapien. It, it pretty clearly, we can say now with certainty, um, first emerged in the evolution of consciousness up the hominoid line about 200,000 years ago. So we've been here about 10,000 generations. The vast majority of that civilization, I don't think, got started until about 10,000 years ago. Sure. So yeah. we've come That's up over right. a long haul, up Mount Sisyphus, or right. up the pattern, and everything like that. So why is it that in the larger scope of understanding things, that we didn't have the right, it didn't come upon the right pattern uh, of, of reality until uh, the year 1776? What makes 1776 a, a point of major departure from history, or is it a continuation? History is just, it's all one continuation of a pattern through in well, time. It, as it, you know, the <coughs> we were in the slave and then the serf, but the mind was not free. Galileo was in house arrest uh, the last few years of I his life. I don't know life. if I mentioned it here, the Catholic Church only let Galileo off the hook about 12 years ago Take, for saying we were not the center of the universe that people believe, people still want to believe that, and that messed with people's sense of identity, and they only let him off the hook about 12 years ago. So old but, ideas but, and old paradigms and institutional structures, architecture, thoughts of human nature and that sort of thing, uh, can hold on for a very long time past the inflection point when first these, the, the leading minds are, are, are bringing knowledge that are inflection points that are going to lead to that. It's a capability. It's not a reality. And so we're sort of in that kind of a position now, perhaps, uh, well, in 2010. The way I look at it, mm -hmm. you had to free the mind first mm -hmm. to build the technological momentum. And could, could I suggest something, Ray? You had to free the mind Homo habilius had a great ability, or Homo uh, uh, australopithecine had an ability. They could bang a stone. He had to free the mind. The mind was freed to a certain degree when their self-reflective consciousness appeared in the form uniquely of our species. That was an inflection point, a major inflection point. All the resources were here when mankind was born into the environment. There was a long liaison with technological extension and building and extending our consciousness and so forth. But it's high. what I'm trying to do is get to how do we get to the major inflection points and the moments of major paradigm of paradigm shifts, or even if we get to a thing where you get to in evolution, you have quantitative change, and then there's a quickening. 
and then there's what they call punctuated equilibrium out of a solid state, uh, out of a steady state system, and you have a new species, something new up here. Are we in that kind of a pattern? Are we <coughs> coming to the end of 200,000 years of well, you, human experience? Are we coming you, to a you, new relationship? You've got into a lot of areas that I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, <coughs> that expert in what I was trying to describe. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. And I think you could trace it in the life of Voltaire. Yeah. <coughs> He was kicked out of France because he got into some argument with a noble, and mm -hmm. commoners did not get into arguments with nobles, so yes. he got kicked out. He got uppity. He got uppity, and yeah. he, he picked that name when he was in the Bastille. He was so, something else, yeah. <clears throat> so there is a man whose mind is not free. He went to England, which was probably a century ahead of the continent in terms of their constitutional freedoms and, so. and, and commercial the freedoms. And the Scottish. And the, the Scottish, Scottish particularly. Like Hume, yeah, yeah. And that inspired Voltaire. You know, mm -hmm. In fact, he wrote you know, one of his famous books and mm -hmm. letters from the, from, uh, the English. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so if you trace that, the, the mind became free. The Descartes didn't hide their best work until after they were dead. Mm -hmm. the, the brilliant uh, scientist were able to create the technological momentum, and that, I think, continued right on until the uh, information age has now brought the work culture up to a new level. Okay. But, but <coughs> oh, okay, by the end of the 18th yeah. century, yeah. the mind was becoming free. And becoming Adam, free. Adam Smith yeah. <coughs> described how the body could be free of primitive needs because the system that had been led by the technology had the capacity to eliminate material scarcity. Okay, so you, again. So you now got the mind mm -hmm. and the body, mm -hmm. but you don't yet have the spirit because the establishment didn't listen to people like Robert Owen on how this system is fabulous, just invest in the people. And, and, and Robert Owen built upon uh, Adam Smith? Absolutely. Adam Smith was a major break point, and yeah. you, that's twice that we've used the thing, a, a term. Where we said that you, you talked first, you, you talked about animal needs or something like that. There are needs. Marx used to talk about needs. In Oliver Twist, all the kids that worked those things like slaves only needed a quarter bowl of gruel. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they, the need can be very, very parsimonious and so forth. Uh, reasonable wants, and then increased understanding of knowledge of things that are growing in the, in the, in the more modern experience is is part of a pattern. But what you're talking about, transcending material scarcity, that's a quality, that's a transformation that is so gigantic, I wonder if it was possible to think that that was going to appear full-blown in the year 1776 when they had a huge industrial revolution, a post-industrial revolution, an information technology revolution that was ahead of that period of time and uh, that w we've come to. And so I'm not sure that we can draw the analogies that are relevant to the future or maybe even understand the present from what was done in, let's say, the wealth of nations or in 1776, uh, well, the, the world. It's a very <coughs> critical concept. You were going back 200,000 years and then 6,000 years to yeah. some organization and agricultural communities are probably four Eight. to 5,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, uh, <clears throat> and the, at the very beginning, mm -hmm. you know, force was not part of it, but very quickly, people that were comfortable with force were taking things away from other people and we build up to empires. Yeah. And the <clears throat> famous emperors who would go out and harvest slaves and, and that type of thing. So I, I think that <clears throat> that is, uh, <clears throat> something that controlled, and when we had the opportunity to get li rid of material scarcity in the world, we didn't have the organization, and the educational community didn't understand the productive system. Okay. If you, if you fast forward yeah, to right ahead. now, yeah. I, would, I would make the argument that we, we not only have the information age, mm -hmm. which requires the democratic work culture. Okay, democratic work culture, that's something we'll come back to. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. We now have, <coughs> through the pension funding, 
yeah. which unfortunately got hijacked by Wall Street. But it the, has, hasn't it? But a the, big problem. But, but yeah. the trillions of dollars of mm -hmm. pension fundings mm -hmm. made owners out of everybody. They haven't yet cut the rewards of ownership. And you see... Well, that, that's a big blanket statement, the owners of everybody. It's certainly not everybody. And in particularly uh, if you're talking on a word scale, if you're talking on a world scale, it's still a matter of some people do very well. Uh, two thirds of the world population lives uh, uh, under a two dollars yeah. a day. They don't have any claim on anything because they're still in a state of utter dependence upon uh, the larger economy. So, no, I, I uh, putting it in a perspective of the whole world, it makes it different. Also, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't mean that <coughs> pension owners <coughs> were doing well. They. They have they're not, not. They've not done well. In fact, they've, they're being raided they've, by they've, some financial capital manipulation. They've, they've, they've lost a lot of their pension money, which was put into high-risk activities, and the zero-cost money has denuded their bond income. They mm -hmm. don't. They don't. Yeah, they right. don't buy large bonds. Well, anymore. we're getting some of the details of it out of yeah. the larger picture. Yeah, but okay. But yeah. I think one of the <coughs> Two points of optimism. One, if we look at what China and India have done in the last decade, okay. specifically, they have used economic freedom to take 500 million people out of poverty in that period of time. Is it really true? That you got statistics that could measure that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, that's sizable. Yeah, that's oh, a major it's, it's transformation. Huge. Uh, and I think there are, you've seen, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, small, few Malaysia, million, yeah. few million people, mm. but he showed the way. Mm -hmm. Their average income went from about three hundred dollars a year to thirty thousand, and his book expressed it all from third world to first. The Manitou, was that in Indonesia? Or was that was that in Singapore? Sing Singapore. 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 Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, you have to distinguish on the levels of of freedom. Mm -hmm. You could yes. have an authoritarian country mm -hmm. it that's, is. that's smart enough to know that you have to free the companies. They may subsidize them for a while, but basically they're letting them compete in the world market. But Lee Kuan Yew went to both China and Russia, mm -hmm. uh, and they went to school and what he was doing, and because the Chinese embarked in 1979 mm -hmm. on 30 years of 9% growth by copying many of the things that uh, Lee Kuan Yew had done. Oh, really? Is that true? They've le yeah. learned from that, right? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, they okay. studied him. Mm -hmm. And they, <coughs> they even, uh, I can't remember who the premier was at the time, uh, uh, <coughs> but they were getting into ideology, and his comment was, <coughs> I don't care whether the cat's white or black as long as it can catch, catch mice. The mice. That, right, that was, right. But we still talk of yeah. China as a communist country. I think they were I saw Mr. Hugh who the other day uh -huh. on television talking about they have to talk to Yankee Stadium, the Communist Party, and he's saying, We are Marxists. We are socialists. We are against the capitalists. We are the ones who the social the promise of the left wing Marxist view of things that the capitalists were the problem in the world private property, the institution, was the problem in the world that had to be overcome. A Marxist critique of things in the mid-19th century. No, Mr. Hu, the head of China, oh, was okay. saying, we represent Karl Marx, yeah. a German import, a Western import. And that uh, it looks terribly like to me, I, I, and he seemed to be saying it with a straight face. But it's like it, it, the capital accumulation. You've got the, the the you know the gated communities. You've got the Land Rovers. You've got the capitalist class living well as always they have, and the mass of the people, particularly out west and so forth, are still wallowing around in the mud. Yeah. And the and the human rights uh, record is horrendous. I mean, so <coughs> is, but they're saying we're socialism. Yes, yes, but and uh, if I may, Ray, let yeah. me because we want to get yeah. to it because we're yeah. talking in public access. So in public access, you don't have all the stars of the society you see on normal television. You have a lot of people representing people's organization, sure. the real people, uh, you know, people who are being shot by police, people who are being oppressed, people who are being thrown out of their homes and that sort of thing. And you got a lot of people who are thought of as progressives, trying to represent the interests of the downtrodden rather than uh, singing the praises of the ones who are living very well in the castle keep on top of the hill. So we're looking at that, and they take a lot of stock of the left, take stock in the thinking of the socialist, 
or the Marxist critique of things. And when they think of capitalism, they think of the robber barons who are uh, at the head of the table enjoying all the benefits while the people suffer as always they have. You understand? Yes. So we're trying to get to a thing where they can begin to see capitalism not as an oxymoron, democratic capitalism, not an oxymoron, but a reality. So I just wanted to put that point across mm -hmm. here now. <coughs> and the progressive community probably does need something other than just a critique of all the things that aren't working well for so many people across the world, some sort of a critique. They need some sort of an idea other than Karl Marx and the no normal socialist view of things. And I think maybe that's what you're trying to get at and suggest <coughs> might be a possibility. Or I'm yes. sorry, if you understand what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, <coughs> what I, I think we were talking about the Enlightenment. If you fast forward to Marx and John Stuart Mill, mm -hmm. both of them confirmed that the system had the capacity to eliminate material scarcity. That is true. And then Marx had the emphasis that we're starting in the wrong place. We're always going for political solutions, and that does not feed people. We have to give priority to the economic system. Okay. And he described the economic system is one that changed the culture from alienation to cooperation. He described it <coughs> as <coughs> one where the, the workers had, with that improved culture, they would build more wealth, but then the wealth would not be concentrated. It would be diffused because they would have a participation in the wealth. And he even saw the you're talking Marx now. Marx. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he even saw the benefits of an economic common purpose where the world would unify and <coughs> the uh, <coughs> warrior state would become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Because we were talking mm -hmm. earlier about mm -hmm. what was available and what happened. I think there were five centuries, uh, the last five centuries, that were dominated by the colonization. Of course. And we still, all over the world, are yeah. suffering the results of that colonization. Right. And we're just coming out of it, in uh -huh. my opinion. The two countries that are becoming the biggest <coughs> uh, productive societies with the biggest GDP mm -hmm. will be China and India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both of them were victims of imperialism. Of course. Uh, yeah. <coughs> the Chinese could have ruled the world back in the 15th century, but they went back internal. But so I do not think that those are countries <coughs> that are automatically linking economic power and military power. I think they are doing so well in improving the lives of their people through economic freedom that unless they respond to the United States, <coughs> they aren't going to waste all that money on military. And that, that can be a watershed event in human history. I see. That's very interesting. They're buying all of our tea bills, aren't they? Yes. And we're we're going into deficit. Well, uh, the United States yes. is, and we've gone into a world where we used to have a. If I may, and I appreciate your mm -hmm. understanding because you've been in the real world. You understand it. You understand and use the term democratic capitalism. That would be a situation where I would suggest capital assets or or technological extensions of human capability. Ca you know, ca uh, can be owned by a wide, uh, a wide number of people to the point where that could be a major source of income to the mass of the people rather than only their labor involvement in production. If you own a capital asset, you get income because you own the thing that is helping to produce the wealth. And the capital assets are all owned by a tiny class of people, as always it has been, <coughs> plutocrats who are at the top of the society, where the mass of the people have only, when they think about how am I going to get money to buy bread or pound cake or something, they have to have a job on an estate run by the people who set up the template who own the assets. It's still plutocratic in terms of the ownership, even though you're saying pension funds and so forth. You think there's more democracy going on in terms of the ownership of the means of production? Oh, yes. I, you I do? Don't, okay. I don't agree with what you say there. Okay, good. Um, there aren't any capitalists anymore in the sense of the Rockefellers and the J.P. Morgans. They're the not. Big, mm -hmm. The biggest source of capital is the pension money. But unfor yes, okay, unfortunately, right. mm -hmm. 
Wall Street was well named. It came to a wall and stopped. Ah, and okay. I don't think too many people realize that, that here was this mandated pension fund, trillions of dollars over the years, mm -hmm. all that flow of money, mm -hmm. and, it, and the most basic thing in capitalism is savings going into investment yeah. at the lowest cost. Right. But I got to Wall Street, and it didn't go on into the economy. Now, into the economy, it went into what's called finance capital. It went into funding all the misadventures that uh, have caused the problems that we had. When did that emerge, Ray? Because right, right. you, you say that there, there's so much of it going on in the realm. You have to make a distinction between real capital investment that's going to pay for itself out of you know real production and so forth, and then finance capitalism. And so much of it has been finance capitalism, Wall Street, that's manipulating figures and uh, contracts and so forth, but it has nothing to do with the real uh, investment in real capital instruments that are yeah. important to production. And they're, and they're not capitalist either in the sense of owning capital that they invest. Mm -hmm. They're world-class borrowers of money, <laughs> yeah. other people's money, our money. Uh, and that, that's a major target of your thinking is the yes. Wall Street uh, thing, and I suppose you were very upset when Mr. Paulson came in to the Congress and said, well, I've got a three-page thing that has to be passed by the end of the week or else the whole world's going to fall apart, and the Congress kowtowed and went along with it, and so did the President, <coughs> to save the world economy and that. Well, there, there are many people that are predicting very bad things for the next few years, mm -hmm. that, that this could be a, a double dip, double dip yeah. kind of a recession and I think they have good reason to worry about it. I think the uh, <coughs> one writer has shown that we need to create 18 million jobs in the next decade, 500,000 a month. Uh, and you need 125,000 a month just to stay even with mm -hmm. the population. Right. But at the same time, <coughs> the companies are awash in cash. They've used so much money on stock buybacks. Yeah, right. They've done that. Yeah. That's that's out of favor now for mm -hmm. the moment. Mm -hmm. But I think there's several hundred billion dollars <coughs> sitting on the company's books, mm -hmm. which could go into the economy and, and dividends, mm -hmm. the capital wage yeah. for uh -huh. the pensioners. Yeah, for the pensioners. Beginning to refresh their accounts by paying that out in dividends. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Exxon and. Uh, IBM, I think, have 85 billion themselves. But the pensioners don't, they're owners of corporate America, but they don't have any voice. The person that decides whether you're going to use the surplus and dividends of stock buybacks is the CEO. In most, yeah. most cases, it's not even a board matter. Mm -hmm. It's the analysis, that's where the public and private interest intersect within, the, within corporate America. When did, when did this take over and qualitative change occur in the American economy? I, I associate it, let's say, with swaps and derivatives. I don't know, about 1990 or so it got started, something like that. When did this change in this tidal flow toward finance capitalism? Uh, has it always been <laughs> characteristic, that, co that conflict between that and real investment and real uh, financial investment? And the 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 kind of things that you're talking about in finance capitalism yeah. that's so well, you're, prevalent today. You're quite right. It it's it's been there since Alexander Hamilton. Okay, but in okay. The, la the yeah. last 25 years, it's gone on. Just went off the Ultra chart. Capitalism. And I I personally <coughs> tie it because uh, <coughs> of a close association with John Whitehead, who's one of the most mm. respected names on yeah. Wall Street. He was a director of the company and a bit of friend, still a friend. Mm. But <coughs> John left Goldman Sachs, mm. and you look back and he, he ended up as Deputy Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. But he, he left in the <coughs> 70s, and I think there was a magic moment when Wall Street stopped charging very healthy fees mm -hmm. for advisory services. At that time, Goldman Sachs wouldn't handle hostile takeovers. Okay. Uh -huh. Now Goldman Sachs will bet on both sides of a trade mm -hmm. and make money on both sides of a trade. Right. Uh, yeah. So they they went to a percentage of the deal pricing, mm -hmm. and I think that's 
what exploded the... What, when, the when, when did that begin to emerge? Late 70s or late early 70s. Late 70s into that, right? Into yeah. the modern and the percentage of the deal, there was a formula 54321, but all of a sudden did, <coughs> didn't have any labor value in the slightest. Uh -huh. But then the lawyers and the accountants, uh, <coughs> I was on a, a board once and I remember the, <coughs> the investment banker Nice fellow, but uh, he had his job to do. Yeah. We'd been working hard all day. It was almost midnight, yeah. and he <coughs> slipped in that their fee would be $30 million. And mm. the directors almost in unison said, what for? <laughs> and then the what do they do? Yeah. And then the lawyers got embarrassed by <coughs> running up their hourly fee to the point of where it looked astronomical, so they, yeah. they started picking boxcar numbers too and I remember a well-known lawyer t saying that he would not be unhappy with seven and a half million dollars so mm. I think if you think that yeah. mm. during that period of time mm -hmm. their percentage of the country's total profits went from four percent to over forty percent Wow really stocks mm. that have been traded once every six years were traded annually mm -hmm. and everybody you know secretaries file clerks mm doubled the salaries over what was going on in the rest of the country, mm -hmm. and that, that's still going on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I, uh, one thing I meant to mention uh, in work experience, I, I was fortunate in a career sense to be the plant manager of an unsuccessful motor company in Bayonne, New Jersey mm -hmm. in the late 1950s. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I just used my high school football idea yeah, right. to develop the individual and the, the team spirit, the uh -huh. teamwork. And <coughs> this was really a Dickens operation. The Some you took of the over. buildings had been there since mm -hmm. 1905. They mm -hmm. were dirty. Yeah. It, everything was impregnated with cutting oil yeah. and full of sullen people, as they said. It was yeah. a, uh, <coughs> So we didn't we didn't do anything magical. We didn't do anything that I learned at Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. We painted the buildings, we painted <laughs> the machines, we cleaned the windows, we yeah. put in lighting. And I must admit that uh, I'm not describing the, in, a company that went from never making a profit to an uh, industry leader in in mm -hmm. high tech motors. But of course, uh, it isn't just enough to have good feeling. Mm -hmm. I could take care of that. But I also got lucky. I had a young engineer named Harris Shapiro who was a motor design genius. Mm. But I, in a sense, helped build the environment of where he could work together with the shop people. And uh, it only took us a few years to go from the bottom of the heap to the top. So I think that's, <coughs> okay, in a yeah, sense, yeah. democratic capitalism is an emancipation process. You just free the people to be as, as good as they can be. Uh -huh. One other experience there, I use the, the expression economic common purpose. Okay. In 1963, we were, I was president by that time of this division, uh, <coughs> and we were doing very well. And one Saturday night, all 14 buildings burnt down. Total, wow. Total wipeout. Did you have uh, insurance? Uh, oh, sure. Mm. Uh, <coughs> I had some interesting meetings with the insurance people. I'll bet, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Uh, but we just we met the next day in my home in Rumson and looked at each other and how do you rebuild a complex business? But we did, and people performed. It just amazed me, the, okay. the quality of the work and the dedication, and some people that even with our best efforts to build team spirit had been okay but not great. Okay. And that, that just, uh, for me, Built into my mind that uh -huh. unbelievable potential when people really work together. Work together. The yeah. tragedy of society is that practically the only time you ever see it is that we're going out to get killed or killing other people. So yeah, in a war time war, thing. Yeah, war war time over time there, thing. over there, yeah. and send the word. Yeah, that kind of thing. Now I tried it's to unfortunate. It's very good you're saying that there is that because it, it really does operate in human psychology. Yeah. When you're cooperator, when it's a cooperative thing, there are really great advantages yeah. to that. Yeah. The other <coughs> thing I, uh, one of the things I've. And is it is it ne is it necessary or uh, appropriate for an operation like that that those people have a sense of some ownership of the company 
other than just their labor relationship to it? Is that it not important? And do we want to get more ownership yes. of the technological aspects of production to the people in general as an income as an instrument of income distribution in the society? Yes. I we was, do. Thank you. That's a huge principle uh, that no, no question. But, but at electrodynamic yeah. <coughs> I got Manny Mann, the UAW, New Jersey rep, and Tony Marino, the president, and Alan Nunzia, out of the chief steward. We all got a plane and went up to MIT to study the Scanlon plan, okay. which was going to divide up improvement among the people. But, so I was, I was at that very right. early. Okay. But we didn't get it in for two reasons. One, the methodology was uh, not good. And, the worst thing you could do is fix the culture, but then go for a profit plan that isn't sensible and people get confused. Yeah, it has but to be well engineered. It has very to be well, well put together and yeah. taking a lot of things into account. But in general, you're familiar also with Mortimer Adler and Lewis Kelso. Sure. And you know I am very much so because they had a system set up to form capital in a way that the ownership begins to be either in ESOPs or in general. Uh, uh, organizations that can get ownership of capital into the hands of the population yes. as a way, not only as a way of, uh, it increases capital formation for us to do what we're capable of, tap into the inflection point given new technologies that are making possible new capabilities, Shumpeter kind of thing, but it also has a way for there to be distributed demand into the society sure. so the people will have the ability to clear the market of what can be produced. Exactly. No. And we have a problem now, if I may, I heard you say that Lord Keynes wrote that letter to his grandchildren, I presume you're familiar with, saying in their maturity, in 1930 he wrote it, and he said, we are going to be confronted with something that's hard for us to understand, and he said it's going to be massive, technologically induced unemployment. Now, he projected that. Uh, last time you and I spoke, we had an unemployment rate of 4%. We now have an unemployment rate of close to 10% here in the United States, and we have uh, problems around the world. And for the most part, for most of the people of the world, the way they have income is through having a labor relationship to production. Mm -hmm. This Marxists call it wage slavery, but they will do, and the assets are all owned by a smarty group, again. And to democratize ownership, uh, is, is a major uh, premise, and what do you think, and you hear more and more people say, we're going to have a jobless recovery, that we got tremendous productive capability, but you don't have a way of getting income to the people so that they will have the ability to, to clear the market because their labor input to the production is not needed in the way that it has been. Henry Ford needed those people to turn the nuts on the line. They're not needed now. They'll be taken over by cybernated systems and so forth. What do we say to that? Was he wrong in that projection, or was he? Yeah, I think, I think he was dead wrong. On, okay, good. On, okay, on, that's good. On the technology leads, and I think the jobs in the in the perfect world, we may only work three days a week. Okay, that would be. A, how every, about two? Well, how no, about one? It, how it, about it, some leisure for things like art and so forth, rather it, than it, just it, working your it, your. It, it can happen. But we, it can uh, happen, but we got some ugly things to get through before we get to that nirvana. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh -huh. Marx you know, covered that one too. The reason I always pick on, on Marx is because he, he, he was not a Marxist you know, in this distinction. He was an almost capitalist. He was a, he, in the sense of theory, he was a capitalist. But the one that uh, <coughs> so impressed me was John Stuart Mill. Oh, a, a brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. And at the same time as Marx, he confirmed the capacity to eliminate material scarcity. That's a huge statement, the capacity to eliminate material scarcity. Yes. Has it always been there since we appeared on the scene? Oh, no. That's what I'm getting at. No. In caveman days, did no. we have the capacity? Oh, if you go back far enough, yeah, they had the capacity because they'd go out and, and <laughs> either get killed by a large animal no, but or killed. No, in, in terms of, like, larger patterns, um, I hate to bring it up and everything like that, but a lot of the extension of capability of technological production has been at the service of weaponry and geopolitical thinking by which one tribe gains advantage over another by developing a Gatling gun, where they go, and it isn't all let's be happy, kumbaya, in the world. 
it is uh, go out and exert power, extend power, and have control over people, and that kind of stuff. And those weapon systems have become very, very destructive. But that in an that, existential that, new way. That time should be behind us, as it I should said. Be, but is it? In here in China, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, it's quite possible that if we did not provoke them, it, for example. Taiwan had a hawk running the place up until a couple of years ago. Now uh -huh. the person that's running it mm -hmm. is <coughs> interested in developing trade with China. The, yeah. the flights between Taiwan and China have gone from 36 to 270 a day. That's a big jump. Isn't it's it? a yeah. huge jump. Yeah. But uh, two weeks ago, uh, both uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton and President Obama announced another six billion dollars of arms that we're shipping to Taiwan. Uh, uh, it just blows my mind that we're still doing that kind of provocative thing. And oh. We're doing it for the simple reason that uh, <coughs> all kinds of people will begin to question why are we spending 300 billion dollars a year plus wars <coughs> in a world where the enemies are a few thousand crazies. It used to be you the... Know, you don't yeah. need F-16s and, and, and yeah. nuclear subs to beat the terrorists. Mm. No, <laughs> that, 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 that's very interesting to me because it used to be, you can remember, you're old enough and uh, we're both old enough to remember George Kennan, containment. We had a view of the world. Political economy, it used to be called, linking politics and, and economics together. And we had this thing. And the enemy that there was of the Western world, the so-called legitimate world, uh, that, sus, that idea of legitimacy, historical legitimacy, was uh, communism. There was half of the world uh, read Karl Marx, and they read let's, uh, private property is the evil institution, we've got to get rid of the private property, set up a socialist system, distribute according to need by common turn and by, you know, the whole thing. There was a real threat. And in 1948, China fell, and we had this thing come. So we were fighting geopolitically that. <coughs> And then that went away after 1989 because the system wasn't operative. It didn't work. And then they, we raided it. Uh, we went and shock therapy into Russia and so forth. But now the enemy, you have to have an enemy in order to gin up uh, military, is now Islam. And Islam has become, that's one quarter of the world population nearly. One, and, and there are parts of Islam that um, are crazies, you know, terrorists and so forth. It's always like that with a large movement. But there's a quarter of the world population. That's the enemy to our legitimate view of <coughs> the world coming out of the Enlightenment. We've set up a system based upon our experience in the Enlightenment. We have a system that's good for the whole world. We have people who cooperate with this International Monetary Fund, all the institutions we s set up. They go along with us, and they call that legitimate. One of the things that they've been able to get away from if I may, philosophically, in terms of um, all the wisdom schools, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Lao Tzu, Vedic, everything, there was a proscription against interest or usury mm -hmm. in all of the systems that came out of history. And we seem to have gotten around that. And the situation down on Wall Street and the financial capitalism uh, shenanigans and so forth have gotten around the proscription against usury there are serious coteries of people at the intellectual level within Islam that are seriously investigating means by which the international order could be structured without interest. Well, interest that, that's uh, been the Quran from the beginning. But yeah, but they're holding to it, yeah. and they're pr proposing it. And that would be a real threat to a system which is run by interest yeah. and by central banks and by a system that's in place, and it may be that threat will be a threat to the supposed legitimacy of our claim on how the world should be set up and the people who cooperate with us. And Islam may have a, pro, a, a threat to the way the world is working in a traditional sense and the people down on Wall Street. What do you think about the fact that there are this coterie of people, intellectuals, not you know, at the mind level, who are proposing systems whereby the idea of interest is not the central thing by which all the e economic decisions are made, even on into usurious kind of conditions that characterizes yeah. it characteristically not. I don't, I, don't, I don't see any great relevance, actually. OK. <laughs> yeah. Please tell me yeah. why. <coughs> well, I, <coughs> I'd like to get back to the enemies. The, the, <coughs> the capitalist system uh, <coughs> 
We're, we're down on a zero interest rate, so the... Uh, we did in Japan, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Let's, if you don't mind, I want to get back to the enemy question. Enemy being, uh, the enemy du jour is Islam. Yes. Okay. And I think mm -hmm. <laughs> the United States is in the peculiar position of being the superpower, but as you mentioned earlier, the first time in history, you try to do it with borrowed money. Uh, <laughs> The, there was a book, uh, <coughs> Boiling Point, by Phillips, uh, traced, Phillips yeah. traced Spain, Netherlands, Great Britain, and now us. <coughs> mm -hmm. And I think if you look at the <coughs> situation with the Muslim community, mm -hmm. there were some severe mistakes. You, whenever you try to do central control, it's got to be mistake prone. That's what uh, that's what killed communism. You can't run everything from a central point. You have to decentralize and get get the decisions and the action close to the people who really know what's going on. That's seen things in market terms. Did Rome run things from Rome? Yes. Did the United States run things from Washington? And they do variations, not but the, they are the, running the show ever since the Second World War, uh, and they've uh, had to get along with other. Uh, the problem is the, the United States. Yeah, let, let me go through a couple okay. of historical events. Okay. Uh, in 1953 in Iran. Mm -hmm. Mossadegh. Uh, Mossadegh was a fantastic guy. He was on the cover of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. He was called the George Washington of Iran. Yeah. And the Dulles brothers sent Kermit Roosevelt over with a big bag of money from the CIA. And, mm -hmm. uh, he bribed enough people to riot, and they, got, they dumped Mossadegh. A, which is studied by every, everywhere every, in the Islamic uh, world, sir. Every Iranian kid and every Muslim kid. Thank but, you. But you can one quarter of the world population remember that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we're imposing like Rome would impose yeah. upon Judea. But you can't you can't find an American kid that ever heard anything about that. Well, that kid. doesn't mean the Islamic world has. And the American kids aren't the thing because they're all within the realm of our propaganda machines and our well, that's templates. My point. That, I, <laughs> but the Islamic world could be a threat, particularly if the intellectuals present a critique of the system that's called legitimate. The system that America is trying to impose on the world, it has not yet been able to do it. It's been corrupted, and it's not adequate to what the future requires, nor can it be adequate to provide for all the people of the world what the future requires, because it's hopelessly corrupted. That's the way <coughs> the Islamic world might see it, and that's a quarter of the world population that might not just accept the idea that the United States of America, out of the Enlightenment, is legitimate historically. Mm. They don't have a system in place that's required by the future in order to realize the full potentiality we, of the we population. Did, that's we did, the point. Yeah. We didn't recognize our role in the world after, after the demise of communism, and we've been messing it up ever since. Uh, I mentioned 1953. Yeah. <coughs> there was an ambassador named April Glasby, fluent in Arabic, was yeah. called in for a meeting that turned out to be Saddam Hussein. You know, yeah. Incidentally, the Taliban loved us when we were getting them all yeah. the <laughs> yeah, right. fired missiles that they could shoot Including down. Including one Mr. Right. Osama bin Laden. Right. And they gave him uh, Stinger missiles and right. whatnot. Yeah. And Osama <laughs> and Saddam Hussein was our buddy when we were fe feeding him all of the armament so he could kill a million Iranians as mm -hmm. he did during the 1980s. But when this uh, ambassador went in, he described this border incident in Kuwait, <coughs> and she essentially said that is a border incident. Uh, it's not of any huge right. interest to us. You know, thank, you, thank you for telling me about it. And then the Hawks in Washington got a hold of it, and that was the first Iraq war. But, that's Tom Clancy stuff, you yeah. know, that's it, but it's real. But it's real. But, but the, the larger but question, the point was yeah. <coughs> that the the single event that I think had such an effect on 9/11 and on this whole idea that we're in a mortal struggle with the uh, with the Islamic world was the billeting of 5,700 troops in Lebanon. In, uh, no, no, in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi. Oh yeah. Near right. Mecca. Right. That was an egregious. Yeah, but the point Reli religious insult. The and point I think it's, if I could finish. Okay, yes. But that—that that is where 
Osama bin Laden you know, developed his fury. Yeah, and they've got some of these people, like we had the whiskey river, we had things like that. But the point is, they may have a critique based upon their philosophy and their view of things. There are people in Indonesia that are studying it carefully. They studied economic theory, you know, from Ricardo to Marx and everything. They read everything that made sense in terms of an Islamic perspective. One quarter of the world population we're in, we're in a competition with. And they said the one thing that made sense to them was a thing called binary economics, which was Lewis Kelso and Mortimer Adler's idea that you would have democratic capitalism disper dispersed mm -hmm. among the people as a way of structuring the economy. And it doesn't, I, I'm happy to hear you think there's some positive direction in that, but it looks to me like the old order is still in place. Mm -hmm. And they haven't been able to establish that with adequate effectiveness, and we've only got a few seconds left. But do you think that there, you know, that the United States does not have a system currently? It's all the same people running things that have been running things. We bailed out the banks, <coughs> and you do have this looming possible technological displacement of labor that Mr. Keynes warned against, which would undercut the whole proposition of the means by which we would build our, our economy since Adam Smith. I think you have two worlds. You have mm -hmm. the one dominated by Wall Street, which is that's got to be caused the unnecessary. Disaster. And it's got to be challenged. And where is of it being course. challenged? It's not being challenged politically. That's, that's except that's, maybe by Ray Carey. <laughs> that's what we're that's what we're talking about. But yeah. I think there are far more people out yeah. there mm -hmm. running information age industries. And there's as we were discussing the. Mm -hmm. The uh, steel workers are studying the Mondragon situation. Yeah, that was in Spain. Thinking yeah. about mm -hmm. doing something on that. And there there are organizations in Europe and in Scotland there are, and, okay. and in China, all of them adding opportunities okay. for worker ownership. So it it, okay. it it it's moral, it feels good. And it produces more long-term profits. And it gets so good companies going like that when you had up in yeah. Michigan, was it? You had that thing. And there's, there's wisdom in that. And there's more good news there than perhaps I'm aware of or the population is. You're making us aware of that. And I thank you very much mm -hmm. for that. And I want to let people see again the book, Democratic Capitalism. And its author is Ray Carey. And also we'll show here, if we can, a copy of a thing called Curriculum. Uh, curriculum which is, lays out his thoughts and so forth. A major voice, if I may, that takes into account the realities that uh, cap of democratic capitalism being able to realize a new order, way of organizing can the I, society. Can I mention my website? Absolutely. <laughs> Web is a website, and you're going to talk to us at ACAP on Monday the 29th of uh, so yeah, mention Your website. Give it up. We'll put it at the end. www.democratic-capitalism.com So I'd be happy to hear from anybody that has an interest in the book or the curriculum. Yeah, uh, and you're in <coughs> touch with a lot of the people that are encouraging these kind of efforts. I think there should be a fire, uh, 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 a whole lot of attention given to the things you're recommending. Yes. And uh, <coughs> from where is that pressure going to come? Because I see too many reports in the normal news that things are just going on in the same old way that's outdated and is not radical to what the future well, requires. I think you're pointing in the direction that the future yeah, requires. I'm very enthused about the activities at Rutgers that the, oh, school, Mr. Blasi. the school of management mm -hmm. and labor relations with the Dean David Feingold, mm -hmm. Joseph Blasi who wrote books on worker ownership 20 yeah. years ago, right. Doug Cruz, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and they have, they're up to about 15 fellows studying these things that are probably going to add another 10 in the next few months. Very good. Have they so got a site for that work or not? Well, they're, well they're, the fellows are in schools Yeah. All Do you have a link to it at your site, to that work? Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Then get to your site again. It's ray dash carry. to your site, your website www.democratic-capitalism.com. Okay, right. <laughs> Democratic cap or you could Google Ray Carey, it'll come up. Right. Ray, thanks a lot for coming in for all the good work. I really appreciate it very much. My Your pleasure. pleasure to have his perceptions, and we invite you tuning in. We're we'll coming back again uh, tomorrow, but that's it for now. Sorry I got off on tangents and everything, no, but I wish you all the very best, and I congratulate you enormously <laughs> yeah. on the work. Okay, thank you very much for viewing. Okay. I got off on my hobby horses, uh -huh. I'm afraid, but that's just... That's what makes it interesting. Mm, yeah.
so um, anyway, I'm glad you're going to be able to talk to us on the, okay. on the thing. You'll find a lot of interest in everything I'm, in that. I'm going to shoot and try, right. to, try to beat the... Right here. Wait a minute, please. They're still, they're still running tape for a second. Oh, okay. they got a couple of shots they're shooting and everything. Oh, okay. I'd like to try and get it over into... Um, yeah, let's be in touch, okay? Sure. And uh, you got you got links to that and um, uh, everything, and um, I, I just see things. I'm very interested in this thing with the Islam. The, the guy named um, Harap out in uh, Indonesia. It's coming out of Indonesia, a lot of this thinking about <laughs> criticizing the whole paradigm. I don't know. We'll see. But it's, and it's, it's grounded with uh, Adler and Kelso and binary <coughs> economics. They say yeah. that resonates with the Islamic, uh, Islamic thinking that could become characteristic of the whole. It, it doesn't, it's just a handful. I'm, I'm 